Santana, you can start now. Yeah, okay, sir. Greetings to one and all present here for the IEEE International Webinar Series, Savon. I am K.E. Sanjana, IEEE Student Chairperson of Engineering in Medicine and Biology Society from the Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering on behalf of St. Joseph's Institute of Technology. I am here to volunteer for today's session. Now, I request Dr. C. Nyana Kausalya, ma'am, Professor and Head, Staff and Student Affairs to give the welcome note. Thank you, Sanjana. Good day, Dr. Robbie Simpson and all the participants. This is Dr. Nyana Kausalya, Professor and Head of the Department, Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering, St. Joseph's Institute of Technology, St. Joseph Group of Institution, India. I would like to extend warm welcome on behalf of St. Joseph's Management and 7 to uh, 2.0 Organizing Committee to Dr. Robbie Simpson, System Architect, G's, G's Grid Solution, Atlanta, Georgia, USA, to deliver a talk on distributed energy resources and its impact. Thank you, Dr. Robbie Simpson, for accepting our invitation and for your gracious presence here. Our respect and gratitude to our beloved Chairman Sir, Dr. B. Babu Manoharan, Managing Director, Madam Ms. Mrs. Sir Jesse Priya, and Director Sir, Mr. Sashi Shekhar, and our Principal Sir, Dr. P. Ravichandran, for their continuous support to conduct this event. Warm welcome to all the participants from various countries, and we are deeply appreciative and grateful to you all participants. Thank you. The session is over to Ms. K. E. Sanjana, IEEE Student Chair EMBS, to introduce the speaker of the session. Sanjana, you can take over the session. Thank yes, you all. Thank you, ma'am. Now, I'll be sharing a few words about our speaker. Dr. Robbie Simpson is a system architect He's grid solutions, where he guides architectures for grid modernization. He is at IEEE, ANSI, IEC, IET, SEPA, and the Zigbee Alliance. Through these efforts, he not only helps to accelerate standards development, but also ensures the adoption of those standards within GE and the market as a whole. Dr. Robbie Simpson received his BS in Computer Engineering from Clemson University, MS, ECE, and PhD degrees from the Georgia Institute of Technology, where he focused on internet measurements, large-scale simulation, network protocols, and information security. Prior to focusing on smart grid, he worked on satellite communication at MIT's Lincoln Labs. He has published several journal papers on topics ranging from network measurements, network security, and network simulation to superconductor behaviors. We are truly honored to have you with us, sir. Before we start the session, I would like to say few instructions to be followed by the participants. Kindly post your queries in the chat box. There would be a question and answer session at the end. The attendance link will be posted at the end of the webinar. Now, I invite our speaker, Dr. Robbie Simpson, to kindly start the session. Sir? Thank you, Sanjana. Yes, thank you. And thanks, everyone, for the, uh, the warm welcome and the invitation to present today. Uh, I hope you'll find uh, the, the topic very relevant and, uh, and interesting. So I'd like to speak to you all today about uh, DER, Distributed Energy Resources, uh, and the impact that they are uh, having currently on uh, the electricity grid, as well as the impact they will continue, the growing impact they will continue to have, and some of the uh, integration challenges uh, that are being faced uh, today, as well as into the future, on integrating those DER safely and reliably into the electricity grid. And there we go. Um, so traditionally for over a hundred years now, uh, we've had a very stable uh, electricity grid uh, and, uh, and, and it's been a, a very simplistic grid in some ways with a one-way flow of electricity. Uh, and this has existed, this, this design has existed for well over 100 years with uh, large bulk generation uh, uh, creating energy that is 
uh, transmitted first through a transmission grid and then through a distribution grid uh, before it makes its way to consumers. However, this is changing uh, rapidly now to a bi-directional flow of energy where um, at the distribution level, uh, consumers become prosumers where they can both consume and generate electricity. Uh, they may have electric vehicles, they may have energy storage, uh, and they may have, for instance, solar as one form of distributed generation. And we're also seeing these renewable um, or DER connected throughout the grid. So at the, at the prosumer level on the distribution grid, as well as at the transmission level uh, with larger, say, solar farms, as an example. So this has significantly changed not just the, the flow of energy, uh, but the way that the grid is maintained and the way that stability must be maintained on the grid. Uh, so the grid, for instance, uh, has a frequency that it typically operates at. But once you have uh, various forms of distributed generation, uh, that can start to impact uh, that frequency and you can have uh, mismatches in frequency. The same with voltage. The, the, the grid is uh, intended to, to remain at a steady voltage, but once you have a variety of uh, DER on the grid, it can make it much harder uh, to maintain a stable voltage and uh, the different DER may uh, be impacting that and have their own idea of, of what the voltage should be. I'd like to start off with uh, some outlook numbers. So these are um, some, some outlook numbers from GE's Global Power Outlook that we conducted in 2019. Uh, we conduct uh, one of these each year, and uh, this is based both on, on what we see as internally as a company as well as a lot of the other research uh, to which we have access. Uh, so this is our best uh, prediction of uh, the, the, the forecast for a um, ver variety of energy sources over the next 10 years. Uh, and as you can see, the, the largest growth over the next 10 years is in, uh, is in renewables and renewable energy capacity. We see fossil fuels and their uh, their share of the, the global power outlook uh, diminishing over the next 10 years uh, as, as more and more renewables come online. And this is, this is very much across the globe um, and has been confirmed through uh, over a number of years as we continuously uh, reevaluate the data that come in. So one key aspect, uh, one statistic here to note is that over two thirds of orders in the next 10 years are expected to be for renewable energy sources uh, with a very strong um, solar or photovoltaic as well as battery storage uh, numbers. And those uh, battery storage is really beginning to, uh, to become more and more popular as a way to store the, the energy that may be produced by intermittent resources like solar and wind. Uh, we see uh, wind continuing to increase as well as hydro and uh, nuclear remaining sustainable, uh, but relatively modest. Uh, interestingly, coal is predicted to go, uh, coal usage is predicted to go down in all regions uh, except for India. Uh, so that is, uh, that is a, a very unique data point for, for, for India. Uh, and as well as uh, for gas turbines, um, we expect that um, there's um, some, some long-term potential there, uh, particularly as, as gas turbines are a little more reliable than solar or wind uh, and may be able to complement the, the renewable energy that is being uh, installed throughout the world. So uh, I hope these, these numbers are, are, uh, are of interest in the next 10 years. Uh, this, is, this is what we expect to see. Uh, and so as you can uh, very much take away, uh, renewables are expected to be the, the largest area of growth in the next 10 years. And here's a, uh, a quick look at the, uh, the mix over the next 10 years for the various regions in a, in a more of a pie chart um, format. Uh, and once again, you can see across all regions, uh, the vast majority of um, new orders and new installations will be 
uh, in, in PV and photovoltaics or, or solar installations. And then I, uh, here's a, a different way of looking at it. This is the, uh, the, the generation outlook by fuel type, or once again by, you know, is it, is it solar, storage, et cetera. And this, this shows it in more of a growth format. And you can see here this, the, the line is uh, indicating the percentage of, um, of the mix that is renewable. So in, over the next 10 years, we expect that to grow to nearly 40%. And that's combining all renewable sources there. Uh, so, although the shares are, are growing uh, rapidly over the next uh, 10 years, uh, just, uh, given the pure amount of generation that's already out there, uh, it becomes a slow 1%-ish uh, gain each year. Um, and then we also see coal, uh, which is one of the, the most used fossil fuels, uh, plateauing in the, in the, early in this decade. And then lastly, in terms of uh, power outlook, uh, I thought it would be good to show uh, the, the, uh, the numbers for India specifically. Uh, so as you can see, the, the numbers for India specifically are similar to the, to the rest of the world, particularly with the, uh, the forecast for the amount of PV that will be uh, installed. Uh, however, coal does remain the, the number one choice in India uh, based on the, the price and the fuel avail availability. So uh, in terms of um, renewables and, and some of the, uh, the, the interesting challenges that uh, increased renewables on the, on the grid uh, gives, uh, this is a, a curve, uh, this is a load curve from California that's uh, often called the duck curve because of its, its shape looking like a duck. And as you can see over time, the belly of the duck gets, gets deeper uh, and we actually, there's actually a risk of, of overgeneration of having uh, too much energy uh, during the uh, the peak part of the day, um, where uh, the sun is shining the brightest, for instance. And then you can see this steep ramp uh, as the as the sun uh, moves behind the clouds and, and goes away uh, for the evening, uh, where you uh, continue to have uh, a load demand as consumers come home from work and, and things like that, uh, but the solar is, is no longer producing. So there's a, there's a variety of risks here, both in terms of overgeneration during the day, as well as being able to handle that steep ramp uh, that occurs because uh, that much change in the dynamics of the grid is often difficult to, uh, to maintain. And then, of course, with this much solar, it's expected to uh, that there will be uh, a sig significant amount of grid stability issues uh, with with things like uh, the frequency of the grid, uh, the voltage, uh, the VARs, um, and a, a variety of, of, of characteristics. So this has led um, many of uh, the folks that are involved in the technology here uh, to recognize that there's a need for communications with DER. So this increased penetration of, of DER, specifically the distributed generation, as I mentioned, can lead to uh, a variety of grid stability issues. And of course, that's unless uh, these issues are, are managed and thought about uh, beforehand. Uh, so some of the ways that uh, these issues are being managed are through the use of uh, what are called autonomous curves, which are basically uh, a set of curves that are loaded into the DER that map out uh, their behavior in response to conditions on the grid. So as an example, there's uh, something called frequency watt curves. So as the frequency on the, on the, that the DER sees on the grid changes, the DER uh, knows to change its uh, real power output based on that um, as an example for frequency watt. Uh, there's also a variety of settings that can be adjusted on DER. Uh, they are very much capable of, of adjusting their frequency, of adjusting their voltage, uh, et cetera, but only if, only if they know to do so. Uh, and so there needs to be means of communications with DER so that these settings can be adjusted. And then lastly, there are often time-bounded controls that might be useful uh, if a utility or service provider knows that um, 
that there are going to be issues on the grid or, or um, that there may be a risk of under generation uh, or over generation, et cetera. Um, there's the capability to send time bounded controls uh, that may have say a given start time and a duration. Uh, so for instance, at 3 PM today, uh, maybe we want to adjust uh, the, the frequency of a DER for, for 60 minutes. Um, so these time bounded controls are also a useful tool uh, that can be used to maintain grid stability and enable larger amounts of distributed generation to be on the grid. Another reason that communications becomes quite important uh, with DER is the, is the fact that consumers or prosumers uh, have expressed the desire for increased engagement and in information. Um, we all live in a world now where we're, we're constantly um, bombarded with information and, and we really expect uh, to, um, to have a lot of information about uh, our, uh, our utilities, um, how we're, we're using our own devices, um, we expect a lot of information, say, on our smartphones. And so uh, one reason to enable communications uh, with the DER, say with the solar on someone's house, as an example, uh, is also to provide the information to them uh, so that they can know how much energy they're using or, produ or producing, uh, what the current price of energy is, if you live in an area particularly where the, the price may, may change, uh, or perhaps you're even trying to enable new market models, uh, so price responsive uh, models where um, the solar may uh, increase its output uh, based on the price of electricity, or you may choose to store that energy uh, as opposed to uh, putting it in the grid, et cetera. Also, aggregation uh, starts to become possible. So there are many... Uh, companies out there, for instance, that will provide a service where they'll install, uh, say, solar for a consumer, and then they will aggregate all of their customers together uh, to basically be like a virtual power plant uh, where these aggregators can then uh, sell that energy, for instance, back into the grid uh, in aggregate or sell some what we call ancillary services uh, such as uh, adjusting the frequency. Uh, and another, another important reason to consider communications is that this equipment is being rapidly installed today. As you saw in those forecasts earlier, uh, over the next 10 years, uh, more than two-thirds of uh, new installations are expected to be renewables. And so these are uh, rapidly being inst installed right now. And unless we consider... Um, communications today, these will be installed without the, the capability of communications and the capability of uh, enabling a lot of these features uh, in the future, should they be necessary. And then lastly, uh, uh, basically each uh, utility or jurisdiction, uh, sometimes it's at a state level, sometimes it's at a country level, um, but they all tend to have uh, rules for how DER are connected to the grid. These interconnection rules um, are typically specified in every jurisdiction. And we're starting to see now that these interconnection rules are beginning to require communications. Uh, so there's a standard in IEEE called IEEE 1547, which is a, an interconnection standard that's used in very many places. And the new version of that standard actually requires the DER to support at least one of a variety of communications protocols. One is 20, IEEE 2030.5, which I'll talk about a bit in a moment because I think that may be of interest to you all. Uh, there's also IEEE 1815, or what's sometimes called DNP3, um, that's more used for utility communications. Um, so think big solar farms and, and kind of more traditional uh, utility-owned generation. And then there's also SunSpec Modbus, which is a, uh, a more localized form of communication um, that can occur over, say, a serial link. And then lastly, uh, another as another example for interconnection rules, uh, the state of California in the United States 
their internet interconnection rule is called Rule 21, and they have uh, been uh, very active lately. Uh, and as of, in fact, uh, about a week ago on June 22nd, they as of June 22nd, they now require uh, all new solar installations at the residential level uh, to support uh, communications. And they named IEEE 2030.5 as the quote unquote default protocol for that communications. Uh, so I think I, I might have alluded to this a little bit a moment ago, but it's, it's important to highlight that uh, communications may differ depending on uh, who owns the DER. So, for instance, if it's a utility owned solar farm, uh, typically you have reliable communications like a field area network or some sort of SCADA communications network. Uh, the equipment is directly under the utility's control. They always know what's going on with the equipment. They typically buy the equipment through a uh, utility sales channel, so they're able to specify exactly the, the configuration they want for the, for the solar farm, as an example. And they have uh, very typical utility communications protocols uh, that they've been using for many years, like DMP3 that I mentioned a moment ago, or IEC 61850. Um, these are uh, very uh, customized communications protocols that are very much focused on the utility industry and have been around for quite some time. Uh, things are much different when it comes to uh, consumer-owned or prosumer-owned DER. Uh, the communications are often unreliable. Uh, it may be the consumer's uh, internet connection, as an example, which, uh, from a utilities perspective, uh, may be uh, not uh, not very reliable uh, because you know it's not a, a communications path that they can control. Uh, the equipment is ultimately under the customer's control. If a, if a customer buys solar panels and puts them on their home, um, it's really up to the, to the customer to, as to which equipment they purchase, as to how reliable it is. Uh, there's really nothing to stop a customer from even unplugging their own equipment, just as a simple example. So it becomes uh, much more unreliable in that sense as well. Uh, Customer-owned equipment is uh, purchased in the retail market, and that becomes important because um, it may be, say, a, a, a solar inverter. A, a consumer may buy a solar inverter uh, that comes from a different state or a completely different country, and so the settings, as an example, in those inverters uh, may not be specifically tuned to your local electricity grid, um, and so the that, that there may need some, some settings and configurations may be needed. Uh, and in terms of uh, communications protocols with customer-owned devices, currently there's, there's really just one that's being used, to my knowledge, which is IEEE 2030.5. Um, so I touched on the fact that uh, customer-owned equipment can be bought in the retail market. Um, and one important aspect of that is because it can be bought uh, from a variety of different locations, perhaps over the internet, um, et cetera, um, it starts to become very important to have interoperability. What I mean by interoperability is uh, there's typically a standard in place and um, two products that speak that standard uh, can, can uh, easily communicate without any kind of configuration or anything like that. So it becomes important to use open standards for such communications uh, because um, we can't have, it, it's not very feasible in a retail market for uh, different locations to have different protocols and different standards um, because um, you don't really know where those products are going to come from perhaps. And then Excuse me. Lastly, um, we have a lot to learn from from early mover first states and locations that have uh, that have been rapidly installing renewables for quite some time, and some of the lessons that we can learn from those places, like Germany, 
uh, was one of the very first countries to really install a lot of solar. Uh, and all of the solar that they installed was not capable of communications. And so they started to see some grid stability issues and they really had to uh, kind of build out and strengthen their grid uh, and invest a lot of money um, in, in strengthening the grid uh, to account for that uh, stability. Whereas, for instance, in California, at, since they're starting to require communications from the beginning, uh, they don't need to make as much investment in strengthening the grid, uh, provided that they can communicate with the DR, with the various DER and adjust their settings. So I touched on this standard a little bit, IEEE 2030.5. Um, this is the standard that's being used, uh, as I mentioned, in California, but it's being used in a lot of places as kind of the what we call the smart grid user interface. Uh, and what I mean by that is it's, it's uh, a standard that's designed for communications between utilities and outside entities like consumers or prosumers. Uh, so it's really a standard that's about the integration of consumer devices into the grid. Uh, and the communication often occurs over the Internet. So security becomes quite important. Uh, the standard itself is, uh, does two main uh, purposes. It informs the consumer, so things like how much energy they're using or what the price of the energy is. And it can also request actions uh, to assist the grid. Uh, it can be simple actions like demand response, where if you have a communicating thermostat, uh, you can request thermostat changes, provided you have permission, of course. Or it can be more complex, uh, like those uh, solar inverter controls that I mentioned a moment ago. Now, this standard is uh, what we call an IoT profile, and I'll touch on that in a moment, but basically uh, it was intended to reuse a lot of the existing technologies and uh, standards that are already out there for communications um, so that it could be rapidly adopted and, uh, and quickly uh, uh, created and libraries and things like that for the for the inverters uh, to make it really simple and uh, quick to deploy. Uh, the standard was designed for a range of what we call backhaul technologies. And what I mean by that is simply the communication network uh, from the utility to the consumer. So in California, for instance, uh, they're using the consumer's internet connection. Uh, in other places, they may be using smart meter networks. Uh, for communications. Uh, so there's a, a variety of different uh, possible communications networks that can be used. And as such, there's a lot of different uh, bandwidths available and things like that. So this standard is intended uh, to be able to uh, be really small when necessary or be really large if, if it's possible and, and useful. And then lastly, the standard is optimized for embedded um, technologies, uh, small devices like uh, smart inverters for solar that may have, you know, tens or hundreds of kilobytes of RAM and flash and things like that. So um, it needs to be very efficient for, for, for coders to be able to, to put into uh, these devices. And they may also be battery powered, uh, like a thermostat, as an example. And so... Uh, consideration and the standard needs to be given to or toward um, being efficient with energy usage uh, because no one wants to install a, uh, a protocol, a communications protocol that's intended to help the grid that actually uses a lot of power. <laughs> so it's important to, uh, to keep that in mind uh, when, when developing these standards as well. Um, so I'll quickly go through this. But as I mentioned, uh, the communication standards, uh, uh, particularly IEEE 2030.5, is designed to use widely adopted technologies. This is really just to uh, enable the rapid development and adoption. Uh, so it's meant to be familiar technologies so that you can use uh, existing off-the-shelf products, existing software libraries. Um, you can easily find programmers that are already familiar with these uh, technologies things like that. And furthermore, uh, if you ever have the opportunity to participate 
in an IEEE standards effort, uh, I would certainly encourage it. There, You'll meet some very intelligent people and see some of the, the cutting-edge work uh, that's going on uh, in developing these standards. Um, but that said, uh, even a, a, a great group like IEEE, where you have some really intelligent minds coming together to produce these standards, it's often useful to reuse things that are and reuse the wisdom of the uh, of the community that has come before you. Uh, so, for instance, uh, it's not usually advisable to create a new uh, security protocol because it takes years and years to figure out all the vulnerabilities and all the the potential ways someone could uh, potentially hack a, uh, a a security protocol. So, for instance, it's it's some most of the time it's best to reuse. Uh, well-proven and existing um, security protocols, as an example. Uh, and then lastly, once you do re when if you are able to use uh, reuse existing technologies, the intellectual property is better understood. So you don't, uh, you may not have as much concern with uh, patents that might be out there and things like that. So this is just a quick idea of, the, of some of the technologies that are included with IEEE 2030.5. Uh, for those of you that are uh, more focused on the power world, this may just look like alphabet soup to you. Uh, but if, if you're uh, interested in communications and, uh, and things like that, uh, these may be very familiar to you. So uh, it's built atop the Internet Protocol, or IP, uh, which is the familiar technology that uh, virtually everyone uses on the internet. It's built using HTTP, which is the uh, the web protocol that everyone uses in their web browser. Uh, it's built for security. It uses TLS, which is the uh, the same thing that your web browser uses for uh, security, the little padlock in the browser. It uses XML for encoding uh, the data. And it uses IEC 61968 uh, as its uh, dictionary, if you will. Uh, so uh, this is a very interesting standard as well, this IEC 61968. Um, uh, you can think of it as the smart grid dictionary. It just represents um, kilowatts in a smart meter. There's something for that in the sim. Um, and so it's this abstract dictionary or data model that's used by a variety of different standards. And then lastly, there's uh, uh, some standards here, XMDNS and DNSSD, which are technologies for these uh, devices to automatically discover uh, one another and, uh, and know how to communicate with one another. Um, the use of the Internet Protocol actually uh, enables 2030.5 and, and a variety of other technologies as well uh, to support different architectures. So you may have networks where uh, you have the communication in the home only. The, uh, the solar and the storage in a particular home may talk to one another and figure out when it's best to um, discharge into the grid versus uh, charge the batteries, as an example. Uh, you may have communications via a smart meter. Uh, if your utility already has installed a smart meter, uh, you can use that network, for instance, to get the price signals. Uh, you may be instead using the Internet to get those price signals, or you can do various combinations of the above. And that's, that's, the, that's the beauty of, of something like uh, the Internet protocol. It allows a lot of this flexibility, uh, which can be quite useful because uh, it wasn't very long ago at all that uh, we would have never expected this much renewable penetration on the grid and that renewables would be so popular. Uh, so it's important to use uh, standards and technologies that are flexible and that can change and adapt over time. Here's a, an example of some of the different devices that uh, consumers may have that you may that may want to participate in these communications uh, standards and may find value. It can be something uh, as something like a thermostat that I mentioned earlier that may participate in demand response program and where it uh, may adjust its temperature based on the needs of a utility program. Uh, it may be something like a smart meter that's just simply providing 
uh, meter data information to the consumer. Um, or it could even be something like a, a smartphone or a tablet that uh, simply shows, say, the given price of energy or simply shows uh, how much energy is being used. So there's a, a variety of different ways a standard like this can be used. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, one of the important ones right now is proving to be uh, integrating DER or uh, distributed generation into the grid. Um, just a quick high level of 2030.5 specifically, it's designed, it's divided into what we call function sets. Uh, so these are independent sets of functionality um, that each device may or may not implement. And then you can have servers and clients for a function set. You can have multiple servers for a function set. Um, if you have, say, um, a different price for um, the electricity of a home versus the electric vehicle, you may want to have two servers. Um, you can have uh, assignments. So you can assign different clients to different servers. Uh, so you may want to assign all electric vehicles to one server and the, rest, and the rest of the house to another server because they may have different prices. And then although we've talked a lot about energy, um, there's a, a growing trend uh, where people talk about the water energy nexus and uh, the impacts that other uh, commodities have on, on living uh, our lives today and and, and frankly, they're, they're all starting to see similar issues in one way or another uh, as we see water shortages and, and things like that. And so uh, this standard can support uh, multiple commodities like water and natural gas. You may have a smart water meter, as an example, um, and, and reap some of the very sim similar benefits that you would in the, in the energy space. Uh, so some of the functionality in that standard, some of those function sets that I mentioned, uh, it can be things like communicating the price, it can be demand response that I mentioned earlier, uh, or it can be something more complex like uh, communicating with a customer and telling them their bill or uh, updating the firmware on a solar inverter. And all of this, of course, I should say is, is subject to making sure that uh, you all have the proper security and permissions in place. Uh, in terms of DER specifically, uh, which I think is, you know, is, is probably the mo of the most interest today, uh, IEEE 2030.5 enables communications between a utility and a DER aggregator. So one of those companies that uh, is basically a virtual power plant, or it can be between a utility and individual smart inverters, individual homes, as an example. Uh, and both of those approaches that are, are being done today in California, like I mentioned. There's support for both generation and storage, and you can get some really good benefits uh, if you can do both. Uh, there's support for all the different DER curves and ratings and settings and controls that may be out there. Um, some of the other function sets that I mentioned are useful in the DER space as well. So knowing the price of energy might allow you to uh, decide whether you want to store energy or uh, sell it into the grid. Um, there's mechanisms in place to target groups of, of um, solar installations. So you may, as a utility, you may want to, for instance, uh, adjust the voltage of all of the solar installations on a given feeder on the, on the, uh, on the grid. And so there's mechanisms to do that as well. Uh, so I mentioned in California, this is being adopted, and um, it's certainly not only being adopted in California, but California is kind of the first mover, if you will, and, and one of the places where this is becoming popular first, and so we're learning a lot uh, from, from their experience. Um, they've developed their own guide for how to use the standard in their specific way. As you probably noticed, it's uh, this particular standard is quite flexible in all the different ways you can interact. And so California created a guide for how they plan to use it. And this guide is called the CSIP document. Uh, if you want to take a look at that, it's freely available on the Internet. Uh, just quickly, this is the architecture that they have in mind for California. Uh, so on the left, 
this IEEE 2030.5 server would be uh, something that the utility would have. And then they would effectively communicate either to uh, a residential or small commercial uh, communication gateway, which may be built into a smart inverter. Uh, they may communicate to an aggregator, which then turns around and communicates to a variety of smart inverters. Or they may communicate to a, uh, a larger industrial, say a solar farm, as an example. And so all of these different pathways are where they are planning to use uh, IEEE 2030.5 and where they've mandated communications going forward in, in California uh, to really uh, ensure that they can continue to increase the amount of renewables they have on the grid uh, while still having a, a stable and reliable grid. So just a little bit more on security, because as you can tell, there's a lot of communications going on over things like the internet, which can be kind of scary, especially if you're a utility who's worried about stability. Um, and so security becomes a, a, a key feature of a standard like IEEE 2030.5, uh, as does privacy. And so one thing to, to note here is unlike um, our typical communications over the internet, where if a hacker somehow breaks the security, uh, they may, uh, you may have access to your files or, or something like that. Uh, unlike that with, um, with this sort of communications or with IEEE 2030.5, there can be real world physical consequences of security attacks. Um, so if, a if an attacker, um, really starts to mess up the, the, the voltage, as an example, on the grid, uh, this can lead to, to blackouts and things like that and potentially damage uh, equipment. Uh, so there can be some real-world physical consequences of these attacks. But at the same time, um, these, this communication needs to work with uh, whatever type of Internet connection a consumer may have. They may have firewalls. Uh, and things like that. So it needs to uh, to be able to work with that as well. And also because this is something focused on the grid and the utilities uh, and, and maintaining stability there, uh, this cannot be the weak link in a consumer's network. Uh, so you don't want uh, consumers installing solar and then finding out they're getting hacked. Um, and so um, it's important to get this, get this right. Um, and then, of course, these devices need to last for quite a long time, and, uh, and there's a variety of, of guidelines and requirements out there that need to be met. So a lot of thought has to go into uh, security for a standard like IEEE 2030.5. Uh, so here's a, a list of some of the aspects there. I won't get into these, but um, certainly uh, you can feel free to take a look at them uh, later. Um, but there's a, a lot of thought that has gone into the, the security for this this particular standard and the way that communication should occur with, with DER. Um, one other standard I, I mentioned earlier that I, I think is important to highlight is IEEE 1547. So unlike 2030.5 that I talked about a moment ago, 1547 is not a communication standard. It's a standard for DER interconnection. Uh, so it talks about uh, how the, the, the inverters, for instance, the solar inverters, uh, how they're supposed to perform, um, how to test them and make sure they perform correctly, uh, and exactly how they should be connected to the grid physically. Um, the newest version of 1547 also includes a variety of different functionality uh, like the ability to adjust bars, um, what are called ride-through functionality. So if there are voltage or frequency issues, how to ride through those issues. And it now requires uh, support for communications. Um, so I know there was a, a tremendous amount of information there, and it was kind of all over the place. I, uh, I, I showed you uh, the, the, the global outlook. Uh, for for energy over the next 10 years. I also showed you the outlook for India specifically, and then a variety of, of communications aspects with DER to maintain grid stability and some of the standards that are emerging there. 
And I realize there's, that's just a tremendous amount of information. So if you, if you want more, uh, there's a variety of IEEE webinars that are available on these topics, as well as webinars from an organization called SEPA. Uh, and uh, lastly, I, I should mention the CSIP document again. I, it, it's not as technical as it sounds. It has a lot of good information on exactly how this is being deployed in California and, and some of the use there uh, that may be of interest. Uh, so with that, uh, I think I, uh, I have time now for, for questions, I hope, and uh, I do appreciate your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for an energetic webinar. Now, let us start the question and answer session. So the first question is, what are the recent areas of research where we can focus in distributed generation in smart grid? Oh, great question. Um, so there's a, a lot of uh, areas of research that are of interest right now. Um, some of it uh, deals with the uh, physical capabilities of the, of the DER. Uh, so there's always ongoing work in, in the material sciences and, uh, and the, the physical aspects of, say, a solar or a PV cell and how to make them more efficient. Uh, we're, we're constantly working uh, to, uh, to increase that efficiency. Similarly, in the storage space, um, storage has, uh, has lagged behind solar uh, in terms of installations uh, because the, the technology is not as mature. Um, you probably have already all encountered issues with the batteries in your phones and, and your electronic devices. And that same technology, lithium ion, is the technology that's often used in storage uh, today. And so there's uh, constant research efforts needed into uh, looking for new uh, storage mechanisms and, and ways to improve the efficiency there as well. Uh, so that's some of the research from the material science perspective. There's also, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, as an example, uh, research needed in uh, further power system simulation and some of the, the grid stability issues that may be seen and, and the best ways to mitigate them. Um, so right now we have a variety of tools that I pointed out, like autonomous curves and various controls uh, that can be sent uh, to DER. Uh, but the, the question becomes, uh, what is the best strategy? What are the best control strategies? What is the, uh, what is the quickest way to, uh, to get out of uh, different conditions that may occur on the grid? And these are all areas that, uh, that not, not many have experience with yet, uh, because th this is really the first time that we've seen uh, distributed generation that may be as intermittent uh, as solar uh, with wide-scale adoption. So, um, there's a lot of new things to be learned there and a lot of research that needs to occur. Uh, I could go on and on. There's a, a variety of, of, re, uh, of, of areas that are, are ready for research here, but hopefully those will, that gives you a, a bit of a range. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The second question is, which one is more beneficial, distributed generation or high-capacity power transit? Oh, great question. Um, it, it, I would say it differs depending on, on where you are in the world and, and what resources you have available. Um, so um, in areas of the world where there's a lot of sun uh, or a lot of wind, and particularly when there's the capability for storage, uh, it may be that DER is, uh, is, a, is a great option, uh, particularly given how, uh, how cheap DER is getting. Uh, one thing I probably should have put in my slides but didn't have in there is in addition to the to the growth over the next 10 years we continue to see the cost of der go down um, and so uh, it's a very cost competitive technology it's a, it's actually the cheapest form of generation already uh, in virtually all over all over the globe now um, however uh, not everyone has uh, a place to put solar panels uh, or has access, or even even in a given uh, region or, or city or a location, uh, there might not be a lot of um, a lot of space to put solar panels, or um, 
you may uh, may need more energy at night, as an example, or maybe you just already have a tremendous amount of uh, hydro or nuclear or something like that that may be far, farther away. And that's when uh, highly efficient transmission and distribution becomes uh, quite important. Um, as an example, in the United States, uh, we have a, an area of the country that is, is very windy um, and is uh, a great place to put uh, wind farms. However, <laughs> it's not really a place where people live. And so it becomes quite important to be able to uh, very efficiently and cheaply uh, transmit large amounts of, of, of the energy from, from that uh, from those windy places to the places where people live. So I, I don't know that they're, they're really competitive so much as they're, they're quite complementary. And I think we're going to need uh, both as well as a variety of other tools uh, to really get to, uh, to the energy future that we all want. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The last question is, uh, what are the latest trends of distribution system protection? Ah, oh, that's a good question. And I, I must admit, I am not a protection engineer. Uh, so I'm not sure that I'm, I'm really the best person to, uh, to answer that. Um, so I, I think I may pass on that one. I, I think it's important to be able to say, I don't know when, when I'm not really the right person to answer it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for answering all the questions promptly. Uh, so could you please stop sharing your screen? So we have small video to play certainly thank you sir we request the participants to stay for a few more minutes as we have a small visual of us sharing our experience throughout this event please use earphones for better experience Saraswati, can you play it again? The audio is not heard. History has proven that those who dare to imagine the impossible are the ones who break all the human limitations. Hello everyone. I am Dr. C. Nyana Kosalya, Head of the Department, Electronics and Communication Engineering, St. Joseph's Institute of Technology, St. Joseph's Group of Institution, India. Work hard in silence, let success make the noise. With the quote in our mind, the journey of seven series has truly been an inspiring and splendid webinar series. We would like to thank the seven around the globe who had taken the time and participated in our webinar series that ignited young fresh minds. This could not have been possible without our management and hence I would like to thank Dr. Babu Manoharan sir, Chairman of St. Joseph Group of Institution, Mrs. B. Jessipriya Madam, Managing Director, Mr. B. Shashi Shekhar sir, Director of St. Joseph's Group of Institution and Dr. P. Ravichandran, Principal of St. Joseph Institute of Technology for their constant support and motivation that have made this event a grand one. Now let us witness our seven and our wonderful team's experience in this amazing journey which has truly been one memorable event. Thank you all. 
Hi everybody, uh, greetings from uh, Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, USA. Um, this is Professor Brian Cunningham uh, from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Um, I hope you enjoy the, the lecture that I uh, gave and recorded last week on the topic of using you know, electromagnetics and uh, novel ideas in molecular biology for doing um, high sensitivity cancer diagnostics. So I uh, wish you all the best and that you enjoy the lecture series. Um, take care. Hello. Dear all, I have been very honored to participate in this IEEE International Savant Series. In particular, I was pleased to present the protection against electric shock, which is a topic that I have studied for many years. It has been the subject of teaching, of presentation and safety courses, and of publication. However, I am sorry that I was unable to meet you personally, especially when speaking on these subjects in front of the audience in presence, I have more control if I can be more convincing and maybe help increase the ability to have safer behaviors in using the electricity that assists us every day in our activities. A dear greeting from Italy. Bye. Hello, my name is Victor Veliadis and I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering at North Carolina State University in the United States. I was honored to participate in the IEEE webinar series of St. Joseph's Institute of Technology, which was organized by the Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering. I want to thank the organizers for their hard work and in all the technical details for a very smooth running event. So thanks again for the honor of allowing me to be part of your webinar, and I'm looking forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Hey everybody, my name is Dan Halprain. I'm a professor of computer science in Tel Aviv University. Thank you for inviting me to speak in the IEEE Savant International Series. It was very well organized, I got nice questions. I hope I managed to convince you that there are many intriguing open problems in multi-robot motion planning and you'll be challenged to work on it. Bye-bye. Uh, Hi, I'm John McDonald. I'm with GE Grid Solutions. I'm the Sparker Business Development Leader in Atlanta, Georgia, in the USA. I want to thank the St. Joseph Institute of Technology. I really enjoyed participating in the IEEE International Savant Series. And I really want to thank particularly Sanjana for reaching out to me through LinkedIn and asking me to participate. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Good morning from Dublin in Ireland. I'd just like to thank the organizers of the IEEE webinar series in St. Joseph's Institute of Technology for giving me the opportunity to present at your fantastic series. I think the Savant program was excellent and I congratulate you all on the organizing of the event and I hope you all found it informative and useful. Best of luck for all your future studies. Thank you very much. I've been very happy to give a lecture for the St. Joseph Institute of Technology in Chennai. People are very kind. Uh, I think the topic of um, uh, reproducibility and benchmarking in the AI um, and robotics is extremely important and uh, crucial for the development uh, of uh, both disciplines. And I was very happy to, to have a very interesting um, question and answer uh, session. This means that people paid attention. And that's why uh, you give lectures. I hope to have uh, other opportunities in the future. And thank you for the invitation. I'm Dr. G. Ruini, Head of the Department Lab Affairs, Electronics and Communication Engineering, St. Joseph Institute of Technology. 
I would like to thank the department and our IEEE chapter advisor Dr. C. Nana Kausalya for her spectacular ideas and the constant upkeep in this webinar series. I would also like to thank the entire IEEE staff and student coordinators who had made a wonderful team together with a great and powerful episode which is quite remarkable. Now let us witness the IEEE student team's experience. and proud for the contribution to the success in the International Savant Webinar Series. I feel great pleasure and satisfaction to be a part of this International Webinar Series Savant. For me, the Savant Series has been an incredible one. I truly enjoy and every single step of Savant Series. This webinar series has ignited the spark of knowledge within all of us. The Savants from all over the world presented mind-boggling sessions that were extremely useful in extended learning and research. And I hope it would be the same for every enthusiastic participant out there. It gave us a great exposure to bring in animal speakers from in and around the world to share their skills with us and share their experiences. So, uh, Savant series had made this mundane and monotonous lockdown into an optimistic journey here. We as a team were able to find our hidden talents and we got a wonderful platform to showcase our talents. Right from sending reminder mails and e-certificates for the participants to digital cockpit, it was such a wonderful experience. I've learned so many important nuances that goes into great team building and uh, more over the work that goes behind uh, such an amazing show. I played a vital role in consolidating the questions to the speaker and I was even a part of certificate and feedback team. I had complex for two webinars under RSSIT in the Savant series. I learned a lot of things such as presence of mind, teamwork and time management. I developed extensive skills in working with the international webinar series Savant. I learned how to be a good team player, the importance of team coordination. I'm happy that I was a part of email communication team. I also learned the art of professional comparing. I was able to acquire more knowledge in many domains which will be helpful for my career. I have learned several important things through this webinar. The way in which I could contribute in sending mails and comparing was satisfying. And now, I would like to personally thank all my seniors and professors who have given me a chance to create a colorful poster on every single speaker. My true happiness in this uh, Savon series was that I was able to connect with the great minds of the world and I could connect with them on a more intellectual level. And I truly uh, got intrigued and inspired with their uh, research interests and levels where I found my happiness in them. It was indeed a great experience connecting with worldwide specialists. For me, in fact, the real happiness was when uh, I got positive responses and confirmation mails from the international speakers. It's been an incredible privilege to be a part of this amazing team who have successfully pulled off this uh, amazing show. It is my pleasure to actually be a part of such big international webinar series of our college. It's my privilege to work with you all. It made me understand the importance of teamwork and gratification. We as a team put so much effort to make this happen and I feel really happy and proud for this. Uh, so this is a typical example of how a team must work and uh, gave me a lot of knowledge throughout the series. I really thank I triply for this and I also thank Savant series. I particularly want to thank our staff coordinators for their determination to make this event a grand success. Thanks to the conveners and uh, the IEEE coordinators for giving me this opportunity. I thank all the IEEE coordinators to make this Savant webinar series a grand success. I thank our college for providing me and the other IEEE students for giving us this opportunity to take an initiative and build a platform for the other students for their betterment. I thank all IEEE coordinators for making this happen. Thank you all for this opportunity. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I am Dino, Assistant Professor, Department of PCE. St. Joseph's Institute of Technology. 
I would like to thank the management, our department HODs and my colleagues for their constant support. My sincere thanks to our IEEE team who has worked 24 by 7 during these days and the true success behind the 7 series was their hard work, dedication and passion to the IEEE student chapter. I just want to conclude by saying the most valuable thing of our life is time and I hope we utilize more productively and creatively during this lockdown period. Thank you. Thanks for all your patience. Now, I invite Dr. G. Rohini, ma'am, Professor and Head Lab Affairs, to express her gratitude. Thank you, Sanjana. Good morning, Dr. Rohini. Very good evening to all. Myself, Dr. Rohini, Professor, I deem it a great privilege to have been asked to extend the vote of thanks on this webinar session on behalf of Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering, St. Joseph Institute of Technology, St. Joseph Group of Institutions. The nation's security and economic growth are tied to affordable and abundant energy sources, so please save it. First, I would like to thank our guest speaker, Dr. Robbie Simpson, System Architect for G Grid Solutions, Georgia, USA, for his informative speech on distributive energy sources and its impacts. Thank you, sir, for finding time and giving information on overview of utilization of energy sources, future standards such as IEEE 2030, technologies for IEEE 2030, in spite of your busy schedule for the Savan 2.2 webinar series. My heartfelt thanks to our beloved chairman, sir, Dr. B. Babu Manavaran, for his consistent upkeep in conduction of this webinar. My sincere thanks to our managing director, ma'am, Ms. B. Jesse Priya, and our director, sir, Mr. B. Sashi Shekhar, for their guidance in conduction of this webinar. I would like to express my gratitude to our principal, sir, Dr. P. Ravichandran, for his support to conduct this webinar. I also thank our head of the department and IEEE chapter advisor, Dr. C. Nyana Kausalya, and all other faculties of our department for organizing this event successfully. A special mention of thanks to our student chair, IEEE EMBS chair, Ms. Sanjana, and student vice chair, Ms. Saraswati, third year ECE, and for all other IEEE students for aiding in conduction of this webinar. I am also very grateful to all the students, faculties, research scholars from India, and other countries for their active participation in this webinar. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you Sanjana. I would like to thank Dr. Robbie Simpson for taking out time from his busy schedule and joining us to share his knowledge. I would like to thank our department heads and each one of us IEEE staff coordinators for taking an initiative and bringing in this platform for helping the fellow students. Especially, I want to thank our IEEE student team for making this event a successful one. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all the participants from India and from all over the globe for their active participation. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Robbie, sir. Thank you so much. I, I do appreciate your attention. Thank you, Sanjana uh, and Dr. Rohini and, and, yes. and, and everyone. I, I genuinely appreciate the, uh, the chance and the opportunity. Thank, Thank you for joining Thank you, us, sir. sir. Thank you, Dr. Robbie Simpson, for your wonderful uh, session and taking uh, time to uh, time.